I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but about two weeks ago, I woke up bright and early. I hit the ground running. Looked to me like it was going to be a great day. Most days are great for me. I just love life. I was full of energy. As I jumped out of bed and began thinking about all of the great things that were on the schedule for the day, some creative stuff, some, some interactions with some people I was looking forward to, man, I was excited for the day. And I, I went over to the dryer to pull out the clothing that I had washed the night before and, and dried, and just in a hurry, I just got dressed and left the house and man the the minutes turned into hours and next thing i know i'm i'm thinking man there's just something wrong with this day i'm just not feeling like myself there's something i can't put my finger on it but but the day's compromised there's something is wrong with the quality of my life today Finally, about eight hours into the day, I began to kind of sense where the problem was lodged, literally. I went into my office and shut the door, and I won't go into the details of how I discovered the problem, but I, but I had to loosen my, my belt and reach down into my pants to find a sock <laughs> that I had been carrying around all day long in my britches. <laughs> now, I'm using the word britches because I just think it's a better story with the word britches. I considered using the word drawers, but that was going a little too far. Pants just sounds, you know, blasé. I mean, this story sounds best when you discover what I discovered and that was that there was a sock in my britches. And this was not, this was not, what, what do we call those little ones? It wasn't an ankle sock, it wasn't a footy. This was a, this was a man sock, this was a work boot sock. <laughs> this foreign thing attached to my person all day long, compromising the quality of my life. Now, I'm going to suggest to you this evening, and you're going to find it difficult to follow at first, but I think that as we pull it together, I'm going to suggest to you that there is a kind of sock in our corporate Adventist britches. <laughs> and the sock in our Adventist britches is, you know what, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to leave you guessing for a while. I want you to to think this through with me very carefully, and, and I wonder if you can just discover what the sock in our britches is all by yourself. I'm gonna do my best to give as many hints and clues as I can. You're gonna have to really, really tune in. Sit up, sit up straight, take a few deep breaths, oxygenate your frontal lobe, because you're really gonna want to pick up on what this corporate problem is that I believe has been compromising the quality of our corporate life for quite a long time. Now, before I divulge exactly what the problem is, um, we need to just back up away from, away from ourselves for a minute, away from Adventism. We just need to pan way out, go all the way back to the early church. I want you to consider with me what I would regard as the Apostle Paul at his absolute theological best. This is Paul firing on all cylinders, theologically, comprehending the core truth of the gospel and how that core truth of the gospel operates on a practical level. So, so this is Paul at his best, in my opinion, in Galatians chapter 5. Paul is reasoning through the truth of the gospel. In this particular passage, he never uses the word gospel. He's being descriptive. 
He's describing kind of the science of the gospel, the mechanics of the gospel. I mean, what is the gospel and how does it operate? Well, Paul's going to break it down for us. He says, listen, I'll tell you what it is. He says, we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, that term is crucial for us to take on board this evening. Righteousness by faith. You've heard that term before, no doubt. If you've hung around church at all, you've heard the term righteousness by faith. This is the only time the term occurs in Scripture as a complete term, righteousness by faith. Now, the concept is replete through Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, and described from many different angles, different language, wrapped around the concept in order to define it. But this is the only time in Scripture where we find the term righteousness by faith. Now, Paul is going to tell us what it is, but the first thing we need to understand is that Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit is stimulating in us an eager desire for it. The Holy Spirit is acting upon us as human beings, even when we don't know the term, by the way, because you can describe things in more than one way. A person can actually have a hunger for something they can't articulate. And I'm suggesting to you that every human being, every human being, has a deep, visceral hunger for righteousness by faith, whether they know that's what they're hungry for or not. Emotionally, psychologically, relationally, what you want, what I want, what everybody wants, is a level of relational integrity that keeps relationships intact. We all want to be loved and to love in such a way that there is relational faithfulness. Now, we might not describe it in that way, but everybody's searching for that relational dynamic. Paul calls it righteousness by faith. Now, the Holy Spirit is stimulating our desire, making us eager to experience this righteousness by faith thing. But the next thing we need to notice is the word righteousness. Righteousness in Scripture is is not what we, in English, in our very westernized, Americanized culture of evangelical Christianity have made it out to be. Righteousness, in a biblical sense, is not a word that refers, first and foremost, primarily, I'm not sure it refers to it at all, but, but it doesn't refer to personal, private, behavioral piety. So you can't experience, biblically speaking, righteousness, for example, alone in a house with a remote control watching 3ABN. In fact, biblically speaking, righteousness is definitionally, righteousness is a relational dynamic. you got to come out of your house into relationships in order to experience righteousness. Righteousness, from a biblical standpoint, is relational integrity. It's doing the right thing in relationships to place others above and before yourself. So, so righteousness isn't not eating cheese, for example, for those of you who are struggling with that. <laughs> righteousness, is, righteousness is the way we see and relate to one another. And as we're about to discover, it is, in a primary sense, it is the way God sees and relates to all of us, universally, all human beings. Now, we'll get there in a moment, but right now, This standard of righteousness, it's so high because, in fact, it's not just watching your external behavior alone in a house in a religious experience. Righteousness is relational integrity. It's it's perfect love in all relationships. And suddenly, you don't have enough willpower to pull that off. Suddenly, you find that it that it has something to do with your heart. It has something to do with the way you think and feel about people before you behave any way toward them. This is why Jesus came along and defined righteousness by saying, you've heard that it was said, you know, don't 
kill, I'm telling you, don't even have hatred in your heart. You've heard that it was said, don't commit the act of adultery. I'm telling you, I'm telling you that the standard is much higher than that. It's, it's in the mind, it's in the heart. And so Jesus, with regards to righteousness, places it within the realm of impossibility for human beings to attain. He does it in a number of ways, but one way that I'll bring to your attention is he tells a little story, a little parable, short little illustration. He says, he says which one of you, by taking thought, by which he means by the exertion of your mind, by the exertion of willpower, which one of you, by taking thought, can add one, he said, cubit, to his stature. In other words, which one of you, by thinking hard enough, can make yourself taller? It's a rhetorical question. What's the obviously implied answer? Nobody. You can't think hard enough to make yourself taller. Which one of you, by taking thought, can add one inch to his stature, Jesus says? Neither can you, who are accustomed to doing evil, do good. So, so it would be on the level of me saying, listen, I have a billion dollars, and I'll give it to you. All you have to do is jump and touch the moon once. How many of you would actually stand up and start jumping? Just a few very materialistic teenage boys. And then they would, you know, get tired and realize they were attempting an impossibility. The fact is that righteousness is a standard beyond our attainment as human beings if left to ourselves. So the righteousness part of righteousness by faith is out of our reach. If you focus too long, too hard on righteousness, not only will it elude you, it will break you. It will turn you into either a self-righteous Pharisee policing the church, or it will cause you to give up in despair and you will leave the church because you will be drained of energy to think that you can measure up. So you can't, righteousness, that's out of our, 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 our intellectual and our volitional orbit. That's not, right, we don't, you can't try hard enough to achieve it. So the part in the equation, righteousness, mm, that's a, but he says righteousness is by or by means of another dynamic. Righteousness is by faith, he says. Now, now faith is a part of the equation where we begin to say, okay, now we're operating in the realm of something that can begin to take place in my actual life. But even faith, according to Scripture, even faith is a gift of God that lies dormant in every human heart. To each one has been given a measure of faith, Paul says, so it's there like a sleeping giant of potential and possibility. But you can't try hard enough to wake it up, to make faith do what faith ought to do, namely righteousness. So Paul adds a genius stroke to his righteousness by faith theology when he says, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And then he says this in verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither this nor that avails anything. Now, I put blanks there because literally, literally, without any exaggeration, you can put anything in those blanks and Paul's statement would remain true. Now, the big hot button theological issue at that time was circumcision or uncircumcision. So Paul, speaking in his current situation, says, says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything with regards to righteousness, with regards to salvation. And I'm telling you, I'm suggesting to you, that you could literally put anything there, and the statement would remain true. For in Christ Jesus, neither Sabbath-keeping nor Sunday-keeping, oh, some of you look nervous, <laughs> neither Sabbath-keeping nor Sunday-keeping avails anything with regards to salvation. You'll have to sit with that for a while. I'm suggesting that literally anything that you put in the blanks, the statement remains true. Because Paul is saying to us, there's, there's nothing 
that avails anything except one thing. Only one thing avails. Righteousness is by faith, and he says, in Christ Jesus, nothing avails anything but faith working through love. Faith that works by love. Now we have an equation that Paul has built for us. Now the word working here is, I don't know exactly how you pronounce the Greek. Maybe it's energio or energeo, I'm not sure. But you can hear the word energy, right? So, so it is literally the word energy. Paul literally says, literally says righteousness is by faith, but then it's like he's whispering the most precious secret of the universe. He says, righteousness is by faith, but faith is energized by love. Now, he's not saying that faith is energized by you loving God. He's saying that faith is energized by God's love first and foremost toward you, toward me, giving rise to response. So, so righteousness is by faith, and faith is energized by love. This is fabulous. Um, Ellen White received a letter sometime around 1890. That'll become important in just a moment. And there was a big, big uh, debate in Adventism about this thing that Paul calls righteousness by faith. And so she was getting all this mail. And one person, well, many people wrote to her with this question in so many words. Hey, Ellen, what is this thing that everybody's talking about and debating about righteousness by faith. What is it? Now, she didn't give on this occasion a really high-sounding academic theological answer. She said, I'll tell you what it is. Righteousness by faith is, and this is the definition she gave, it is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. So, so she was speaking practically, and she was actually speaking, she was speaking a theological language here. She was speaking Pauline. She was, her mind is in Galatians. She comprehends Romans. She's thinking, okay, righteousness is, is, is the active principle in love, of love, and the Holy Spirit is the, is the, the activating influence, the, the stimuli. The Holy Spirit is the one who, just like Paul said, who's stimulating a desire for righteousness in the human heart. So I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to suggest to you that righteousness by faith is a relational dynamic. In fact, righteousness by faith is the highest form of healing psychology. Righteousness by faith produces deeper, more lasting transformation in the human soul than any counseling session you've ever had, than any self-help book you've ever read. And that's not to put down counseling or self-help books. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. But I'm telling you that you can cut to the chase and leapfrog right over everything and encounter righteousness by faith for all its worth and it will exert an influence so lasting, so deep, so powerful that you'll never be the same again. So here's the relational dynamic according to Paul in Romans chapter 4. So track with me here. You have to follow his reasoning because you know Paul's kind of complex. Peter didn't even like the writings of Paul. So you need to think this through with me for a minute. Paul is a little complex, but in, in Romans chapter 4, Paul is defining the relational dynamic of righteousness by faith, and he says, okay, let me, let me wrap language around this. Let me, let me tell them what it is. Now, his context is the story of Abraham, and he says in Romans chapter 4 that, that, that what God was doing with Abraham and what God wants to do and is doing with you is this. God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, when you do that as a human being, that's called lying. Don't do it. But when God calls those things which do not exist as though they do exist, it's not lying because, because there's actualizing power in the Word of God. There's actualizing power, I'm going to suggest to you, in the love of God. We'll get there in just a moment. Now, 
Paul is saying, God calls those things which do not exist as though they do. So you're wondering at this point, so am I. Well, Paul, what do you mean? What are the things that God declares or speaks or says that aren't, but yet he speaks them as though they are? Well, his context is righteousness, innocence. In other words, Paul is saying, listen, he's saying, God regards you as righteous even though you're not. And he relates to you as if you're innocent, as though you've never done anything wrong in your whole life. He relates to you as if you're perfectly innocent, even though he knows you're as guilty as the day is long. Now, this is a relational dynamic. This isn't, this isn't God, God plying fiction, because again, the way God relates, this is so crucial to understand, the gospel, in a sense, is prophetic. God prophesies righteousness and innocence over us, and the thing he prophesies becomes true. That's how powerful his love is. Now, on a, on a human level, on a micro level, we experience the power of this kind of thing all the time. You know, if you have a little boy and you say, hey, Johnny, would you sweep the kitchen floor? He's five years old. The broom is bigger than he is. He doesn't know how to handle it. He doesn't have the dexterity. He doesn't have the balance. The broom is everywhere except sweeping up the stuff that needs to be swept up, and he feels pretty good about the job he's done. And if you come along and you impose incrimination, give me that broom. I'll show you how it's done. Can't you do anything right? Sweep, sweep, sweep. That's how you sweep a floor. What you just did is you killed Johnny's motivation to ever want to sweep the floor again. And if you relate to a child that way enough, all desire to please will be killed in that child's little heart. But if you, with love, let your love cover all the junk on the floor, and you say, good job, dude. Man, you should be a professional sweeper. In fact, you'll do all the sweeping from now on until you're 36. <laughs> if you relate to him as though he did a good job, you are, in a sense, as a father, as a mother, you are prophesying success over Johnny. You are creating a vision of himself that he cannot conjure for himself. You're basically loving him in to effective sweeping by overlooking his failure to do it right. It's a relational dynamic. Now, God made us and therefore understands our psychology, how we think and feel and operate and behave. And he says, listen, I'm going to relate to you as if you're innocent, even though I know you're guilty. I'm going to relate to you as if you're righteous, even though I know you're not, you're sinful. And then, and then Paul builds his argument through the book of Romans. And when he comes to chapter 6, he says this. It's very fascinating. He says, likewise. Now, the likewise refers back in chapter 6, chapter 5, to everything that has been objectively achieved in Christ. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does the word reckon mean? Well, a synonym might be to regard yourself to be something, to reckon yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. You know upon self-examination that you are very much alive to sin and its pull upon you. But Paul is saying, listen, listen. In your mind, in your heart, by faith, extend yourself beyond what you are to see yourself in Christ. God regards you as innocent and righteous. Now start thinking of yourself like that. Start relating to yourself as if you were what you're not and lo and behold, you will begin to become what you're not. Your, your reality will catch up with 
your heart's aspirations, or more precisely, God's aspirations for you. So, so here's, here's what Paul is saying, essentially. He's saying that God relates to me and you according to my potential, not according to my present reality. That's why I said it's a relational dynamic. It's the way he's, it's the way he's seen and relating to me, okay? So then Paul comes along, and in another passage, he's teaching the same truth of righteousness by faith, but he's using different language. And this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Track with this. He says, the love of Christ compels us. I like the way the, the uh, Amplified Bible says, the love of Christ urges us on. So the love of Christ, it's a motivational impetus. It's, a, it, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's regenerative. It's creative. So the love of Christ, it, it, it compels us. It compels us. Now watch this. Because we thus judge. The word judge here means more like discern or perceive. The love of Christ compels us. He's about to tell us what it compels us to do or not to do. It compels us because we perceive something. Something's dawned on us. We've, we've judged thus. That if one died for all, that's Jesus, then there's some sense in which all died. So, so, so when Jesus died on the cross, this was a a representative act for the whole human race. So, so as a representative act, it's kind of like this. Um, we sometimes use this representative language. You know, we might say that, that the ambassador of the United States of America is over in China having talks with the Chinese, and we might say we, Americans, are in political talks with China. No, we're not, but our representative is. So, so Jesus, as our corporate head, as our representative, when Jesus died on the cross, it was a universal embrace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him. But before we get to the whoever believes part, he gave his life for who? The world. So, so what's happening here is Paul is saying, listen, listen, listen. The reason why this love of God is so compelling, it's just like blowing us up with power to be things we could have never been otherwise, is because we've discerned something, and that is that God in Christ literally loves everyone. Nobody's excluded. This stands, by the way, over against, in stark contrast, Calvinism's limited atonement. So, so then he goes on, and this is fabulous. Watch this. He says, and that he died for all. Jesus died for everybody so that, in order that, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Do you hear what Paul is saying? He's saying the love of Christ compels us. At that point, we're saying compels us to do what or to not do what? And now he tells us. He says the love of Christ, it compels us to stop living for ourselves and to begin living for him. It changes us at the most fundamental level that a human being can be changed. It shifts the human focus outward to Christ. The egocentricity that is natural to human nature is broken up by virtue of the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary. Our narcissism is broken by the love of God in Christ. Our focus becomes outward. We begin to see something. So, so, so what Paul is saying is he's saying, listen, God's love is a creative force. It changes me. It changes you on a deep, deep level. Ellen White says it this way. She says, love is power. Intellectual and moral strength are involved in this principle and cannot be separated from it. Love cannot live without action, and every act, that is every act of love, increases, strengthens, and extends it. It is love. In other words, love is an exponential principle. Every time you, every time you act out the implications of love, it expands to take up more emotional and relational space in your life. 
So, so love, she says, will gain the victory. I mean, that, that's the thing that is going to finally gain the victory. So back to Paul now in the 2 Corinthians text. This is just mind-blowing. Watch where he goes with this relationally. We said that righteousness by faith is a relational dynamic. Primarily, it is, first and foremost, it is the way God relates to me, the way God relates to you, right? Now watch this. He says, the love of Christ compels us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then, whoa, all died in Christ. This is amazing, Paul says. So much so that this love changes my self-centered focus, so I begin to live for him who died for me and rose again. And then verse 16, therefore from now on, from the point at which I have the vital encounter with the gospel, from the point at which I see the love of God for me as equally for all, the moment God's universal love dawns on me, from now on, he says, we regard no one according to the flesh. We cease relating to people according to their natural fallen carnality, their fallen condition. We stop relating to people according to their unrighteousness and their guilt, and we begin relating to people how? Well, precisely the way God relates to us, calling those things which do not exist as though they do exist. We begin to relate to people differently. I'm going to summarize it like this for you. The way I see God seeing me, and you can add there relating to me, the way I see God seeing me determines the way I see myself, right? That's natural. You, you follow so far, right? The way I see God seeing me, whoa, God, you love me like that. That's amazing. L Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. I'm fallen. But you love me without condemnation? That's just so astounding. So it changes the way I see myself, Paul says. But here's the kicker. It then changes the way I see others. Because precisely the way that God sees me, are you tracking? Is according to Paul, the way he sees everybody. So how can I see anybody any differently than the way God sees them, that is to say, the way he sees me? Changes everything. Now, this is simply to say, that according to Paul, the gospel has an objective dimension, which is the facts of the gospel. Something occurred in the person of Christ historically 2,000 years ago over which I had no control and to which I had no, made no contribution. He just did something. It's history. It's the facts of the gospel. It's what Paul calls in Romans the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Done deal, accomplished fact. It's, it's, it's history. Are you still with me? That's a little hard for us Westerners to wrap our minds around. But our representative head, our new Adam, the new man, Jesus, achieved a lot in that one human life. That's the objective fact. But then the objective facts of the gospel have subjective experiential overflow. And, the, and this doesn't change the facts. There's nothing in my experience that alters the historical facts. Right? Faith doesn't make new facts. Faith doesn't produce more data in the gospel. My experience doesn't produce any new data. Faith is me experiencing the data, the facts of the gospel. It's extremely humbling, and rightly so, because you remember that righteousness is outside of our moral orbit. You need to be loved unilaterally. You need to be loved by a God whose love is so absolutely, unequivocally, unconditional that there's literally nothing you can do to alter it 
by way of right deeds or wrong deeds. God's love is a full throttle, pedal to the metal, static, very, very high velocity reality that is coming at you all the time. And you can never, ever, ever turn it off or down or divert it by anything you do. He just simply loves you, full stop, end of subject, and now just be in awe of that. Just allow it to be what it is. And, and here's the thing. What Paul is saying is there's a sense in which you are in Christ what you are not in yourself. So, so my life, my life is, is in a process of incrementally catching up with the reality that is already fully intact in Christ. And this is why there, there can be no merit. <laughs> I don't manufacture anything. So at this point, we need to have a brief tour of Adventist history in relation to righteousness by faith. Um, I don't mean to be mean right now, but some of you might not like some of this. Um, please be patient with me as I try to articulate this. Be nice to me. I'm not Paul. I'm not Isaiah. I'm not a prophet. I'm Ty. This might not come out exactly the way you want it to come out, but try to hear what I mean if you don't like something I say. Okay, that's my little preface. Now I'm going to go for it. So a brief history of Adventism, something like this. We trace our beginnings as a people to 1844. In 1844, a movement was born. By the way, it was a movement that was brought into existence by teenagers and young adults. The prophet was a teenage girl. The biblical scholar among them was like 13. His name was J.N. Andrews. He had much of the Bible memorized. It was a group of teenagers in a room. The old guy was Joseph Bates, and he was like in his 30s or something like that. Adventism came into existence as a movement of teenagers and young adults. And that movement came into existence, and it was a, it was a reformatory movement. It was, it was on the tail end of the Protestant, what do we call it, the Protestant what? Reformation. So there's an accumulation of, of, of light and strands of truth that are being pooled together. Sometimes somebody says, hey, you're a Seventh-day Adventist, what does that mean? I say, well, I'm kind of like a an amalgamation of all the Protestant denominations you've heard of. Like the Baptists, I believe in baptism by immersion and adult consent in matters of faith because of free will. Like, like the Methodists, I believe in the, re, the rebirth and systematic Bible study, Methodism. Uh, and, and like the, I won't go on because I'm going to run out of time, but you see the point. They begin, to, they begin to pull together, and there were additional discoveries that were made. And so something happened from 1844 in the next couple of decades. There was composed what we might call the, the doctrinal portfolio of Adventism. And that doctrinal portfolio, as you know, was composed of things like the Sabbath and State of the Dead and Second Coming and Sanctuary, right? Are you with me still? Are you tracking with me? So 1844, this begins to happen. This, this massive doctrinal discovery begins to occur. Now, as that discovery begins to happen, around 1852, the girl, the prophet, this young lady, begins to say, you know what? We're getting a little high on ourselves regarding all of this truth we're discovering. And she, for the first time in 1852, identifies that small band of Adventists as slipping into what she called the Laodicean condition. 1852 was the first time she applied that Laodicean message and revelation to Adventism. And she, she was applying it in a specific way. She was saying, listen, you think you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. The goods were doctrinal goods, theological goods, not, not physical material, not money and 
and, and, and material stuff, but theological goods. You are, you, you're perceiving yourself as theologically rich and increased with goods, and uh, you are. I mean, we are. We've got all these truths. But then she went on to say, listen, the message says that even though you're rich and increased with goods, theological, doctrinal discoveries, amazing, your, 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 your spiritual arrogance meter is like, eh, 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 eh. and she's saying, you need, to, you need to take a look at the rest of the message because it says you need gold tried in the fire, which she specifically identified as faith working by love. You need white raiment, which she specifically identified as righteousness by faith. And you need ISAB, which she specifically identified as the discerning influence of the Holy Spirit. So, so it's possible, listen, listen, listen. This, this, in these early days, Ellen White began to inch toward identifying that it is possible to intellectually and theologically hold doctrinal facts outside of Christ. And it will do great spiritual damage to those who undergo that bifurcation of gospel from doctrine. So she began to identify this. Now, there are two, you probably can't see these, so I'm going to go through them very fast. If you could put these on the screen and leave them there as I, as I try to let people look at them. So in 18... 76, James White, Ellen's husband, issued an evangelistic tool. They didn't have keynote like we have or PowerPoint, so they'd have a big easel with a picture, and they would have a long pointy stick, and the evangelist and preacher would point to the composite different bar and teach, right? That's the idea here. So, so it's a, you know, it's kind of, it's not great art, but it is a bunch of stuff in order to night by night by night preach the message, right? You'll notice in 1876, this was issued by James White, You'll notice that the tree of life is in the center there with the Ten Commandments hanging from its branches. And the cross is there, slightly off to one side and receding. You, you get the picture, right? This is 1876. Now, this is fascinating. I'll share with you why in just a moment. But in 1883, and this was the year after James White died, Ellen White took this one off the market in a sense. She nixed it. And she went to the artist and she recommissioned a new picture. She even retitled it, Christ, the Way of Life. The other one was called From Paradise Lost to Paradise Restored. Ten Commandments! This one was Christ and Him Crucified. Central focus. And the law of God is still there, but you have to look a little carefully to find it because it's represented in the upper left-hand corner by Mount Sinai with the lightning and the thunder and the dark clouds. Because the law, Paul teaches, is a schoolmaster. It's a disciplinarian to lead us to Christ in whom salvation is alone present, fully accounted for. So, so the law has no saving power. And, and so this began to be depicted. Now, that was 1883. In 1888, some of you, if you're Seventh-day Adventist, you've heard of this. If you're not Seventh-day Adventist, welcome. We're really glad you're here. We're doing a little bit of in-house talk here for a minute. I think you'll benefit from it as well because these are universal human realities. Uh, so thank you for spending this time with us. But those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists, in 1888, we had what was called the Minneapolis General Conference Session where a couple of young men who were theological buddies who were studying Paul Romans and Galatians specifically. A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, one a second-generation Adventist, the son of J.H. Wagner, who was at that point the editor of the Signs of the Times, the evangelistic magazine of the church, J.H. Wagner. His son, E.J. Wagner, was a medical doctor who graduated from medical school at the age of 27, but became obsessed with theology after sitting in a series of tent meetings in California that Ellen White conducted that were titled The Gospel of God's Grace. He traced his conversion to that series of meetings. He met a convert to Adventism named A.T. Jones, a military guy, and they became theological buddies. 
comparing notes, studying together, and they became co-editors of the Signs of the Times. Ellen White was very supportive of these two young men and their discoveries, theologically. So much so that the, the influence, her influence, and the influence of others who were pretty excited about what was coming out of their mouths, because at that point, to that point, Seventh-day Adventists had done no serious study of Paul, except for to cherry-pick verses to prove that you should still keep the law. And so they were actually studying contextually what Paul means by terms like righteousness by faith and justification by faith. And Ellen White was like, yes, that, she said, that's where we need to be going as a people. So that they ended up in 1888, these two young men, teaching righteousness by faith meetings, which threw Adventism into a theological tizzy, to say the least. And we're still, right now, in the aftermath of that theological meltdown that occurred, which is where I'm going in just a moment. Am I? Yes, I am. So, what's happening here is, in 1888, Jones and Wagner proclaim a message. Later on, Ellen White would summarize what she heard, and she said things like, when she heard them teach, she said things like, every fiber of my being said amen. Now, I suspect that some of you felt that way moments ago when we were reading Paul and talking about righteousness by faith. Something was stirring inside of you. I could see it on some of your faces. Some of you are like, what? What? This is it. This is it. This is it. This has got to be it. And you might say something like, every fiber of my being was saying amen as we were reading what Paul was saying. Now, that's how Ellen White was responding to Jones and Wagner's preaching. And she said, in retrospect, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. And then she described what that message composed of. And it was the message of righteousness or justification by faith. And she said that it is the third angel's message in verity or in truth. So, so that was 1888. Now, here's what you need to understand at this point. I went through that really fast in order to come to the 1890s. So Adventism is in a theological brawl at this point with Jones and Wagner and Ellen White on one end of the, the theological battle and then some very, very important figures in Adventist history, the General Conference president, whose name was G.I. Butler, and the Adventist Review editor, whose name was Uriah Smith. Both very formidable individuals in Adventism. And they were out in the eastern side, and Jones and Wagner and Ellen White were out in California, and there was kind of a duel, a theological duel that began to take place between articles published in the Signs of the Times that they had control of and the Adventist Review that Uriah Smith had control of. And so Adventism is going through this, and then Ellen White begins, well, it doesn't begin, the whole time she's chiming in. She's just writing letters like mad. The girl has writer's cramp for sure, though we have no record of it. She is writing one letter after another to church leaders, and she's saying things like this to Stephen Haskell in 1892. She says, in the context of Righteousness by faith in the context of Jones and Wagner in the context of 1888 General Conference session. She says the whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of God, she says. Now, that's language that is familiar to Seventh-day Adventists. The whole, this is like the universal, this is the gospel going viral, we would say, in modern vernacular. The whole earth is going to be lightened with the glory of God. And then she says this. She says, but how hard... How hard to get out of what she called the rut of legal religion. How hard to grasp the rich, free grace of Christ. She's talking to Stephen Haskell, also a church leader of the time, and she is lamenting the response of people like G.I. Butler and Uriah Smith and others that she called a confederacy that were mounting their influence against the gospel entering Adventism. She called it a confederacy. 
And she's telling Stephen Haskell, man, it's so beautiful. The gospel's so amazing. But how hard it is to get our Adventist selves out of the rut of legal religion. So let that language sink in. What's a rut? Have you ever gotten your car in a rut? What, what is the characteristic of a rut? Well, you're stuck, okay? And Adventism, in a sense, has been stuck for more than 100 years in a rut of legal religion. Now, some people, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are sitting there thinking, I saw some of you went like this. You crossed your arms. I saw it. You crossed your arms. And, and I read body language, and so when you did that, I know what it meant. I'm reading your mind right now. Some of you went like this. And when you did that, what you were thinking was, legalism? I don't think so. The church is liberal now. <laughs> That's what you were thinking, wasn't it? Okay, but let me just tell you something. Legalism, legalism, and liberalism, are you listening right now? Legalism and liberalism are not opposites. Nope. And legalism is not a conservative phenomenon. There are only two options, legalism and the gospel. You say, no, 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 there's also liberalism. No, 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 no. There's the gospel and there's legalism. And on the side called legalism, there's liberal legalism and there's conservative legalism. There is short-list legalism and long-list legalism. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter if the list is short. Well, all I have to do is in order to be all you have to do? Are you looking for minimum requirements? Liberalism is a form of legalism, and conservatism is a form of legalism. There's the gospel and there's legalism. Those are the only two options for belief systems in all the universe. Okay, so now this is important to understand. This is important to understand. Conservatism, legalism, conservatism, and liberalism on opposite ends of the spectrum actually <laughs> feed one another's extremes. Yeah. They produce one another's psychosis. So never forget this. Listen, listen, listen. Jesus was crucified by a coalition of conservatives and liberals who got together for political convenience and crucified the Lord of glory. You don't need to say, ah, oh, but the church is liberal now, so we need a little more law. No, 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 we need the gospel. And you don't need to, you don't need to say, wow, the church is legalistic. We need some more liberalism. No, no, we need the gospel. We don't need, we don't, this whole pendulum swinging thing that we've been doing approximately forever as Adventists, back and forth, we don't need to overcorrect to one extreme or the other to correct the opposite extreme. The gospel is the remedy for both ends of the legalism spectrum. Yeah. Adventism needs the gospel. That's what Adventism needs. So Ellen White goes on and she says this. This is going to blow your mind. She says, God calls upon those who claim to believe present truth. This is 1892, and she's wrapping language around what the issues are. God calls all who claim to believe present truth. She's being specific. She's saying, in between the lines here, she's saying, Uriah Smith, I'm talking to you. G.I. Butler, I'm talking to you. She's saying, all who claim to believe present truth, here's what you're called to do. To the work of diligently gathering up the precious jewels of truth, at which point Uriah Smith is saying, that's exactly what I've done and am doing. And you know who you are, Uriah. You're here tonight. <laughs> the truth. That's what we need Gather up the truth. But she's not done. She's making a point. Everyone who believes present truth, you're called upon to diligently gather up the precious jewels of truth. Watch this. Watch this. Are you what? And placing them in their position in the framework of the gospel. 
Let them shine in all their divine beauty and loveliness in the context of the gospel. <laughs> That's her point. You need to take the entire Adventist portfolio of doctrine and baptize it in Christ. In fact, I said to somebody recently and they thought it was an extreme statement, it's not. Adventism really could undergo a corporate rebaptism. Like the whole lot of us just need to go down to some river somewhere and just get rebaptized in Christ. With all of our doctrinal knowledge, taking it under the water with us, and having it come back up in the glorious light of the grace of God in Christ. Now, in that historical context, by 1899, we had another general conference president. His name was G.A. Irwin. And G.A. Irwin observed in a letter that he wrote to a ministry colleague looking at 1888 and what might have been, he said, we, speaking of Adventists, we would have been, if we had accepted the gospel and woven it into Adventist doctrine, we would have been infinitely further along in the message than we are today, by which he means we would be much more theologically mature than we are as a people. We, we have reduced the Sabbath to a right day, wrong day argument. And the gospel of God's grace has been present as the secret treasure all along within the Sabbath. And the same is true of our entire doctrinal portfolio. We think that because we persuade somebody to switch from the wrong day to the right day, that we've achieved something. Well, we have achieved something. We've baptized their legalism and brought it right into the church. We have baptized a way of thinking, and then we try to do church together. Is it any wonder that we are in a constant conflict as Adventists over peripheral issues. He says, we would have been far more theologically mature by now if we had accepted the gospel. Now, A.G. Daniels, in, in 1902, is the general conference president, and he's musing about this history. They're all thinking about this. It's all they're talking about. They're letters back and forth. And A.G. Daniels, in 1902, writing to W.C. White, Ellen White's son says or speaks of, get this language, the whole brood, that's a word that refers to serpents in a hole, by the way, the whole brood of old covenant men who are continually raising doubts and unbelief regarding the light that came at, at the Minneapolis meeting. He's saying that there is an old covenant coalition of men of influence who are barring the access of the gospel to Adventism. We keep, Ellen White's been shouting it, Jones and Wagner have been saying it. By this point, a guy named W.W. W. Prescott is on board, Stephen Haskell is getting it, and A.G. Daniels is frustrated. He's saying there's this old covenant brood, there's this crew, there's this posse of old covenant theologians who just won't let Jesus become central in Adventism. And he called them the old covenant brood because they don't believe the gospel. Now, if you just walk right up to them and you say, do you believe the gospel? They're going to say, yes, we believe the gospel. If you go a step further because you're unsatisfied with that answer, would you define it for me? They will say something like, yeah, I believe the gospel. The gospel is victory over sin. The gospel is obedience to the law of God. The gospel, and at that point, you know you're dealing with a pagan version of Adventism. It's paganism. It's Catholicism in Adventism. It is salvation by works, which is the diabolical teaching of Babylon that is to be brought down by the gospel that we're called to preach. So then Ellen White comes along and she says this. There's nothing like having a prophet. The development of the desire, she says in 1903, the development of the desire to control 
has been very marked. And God sent warning after warning forbidding confederacies and consolidation, that is, of political power in Adventist circles. He warned us, God warned us, warned us against binding ourselves to fulfill certain agreements that would be presented by men laboring to control the movements of their brethren. She's saying, listen, listen. <laughs> She's essentially saying that legalism invariably arouses in human nature the impulse to control others. And she's saying there is a direct correlation between our resistance of the gospel in 1888 and the trajectory toward creating more and more control mechanisms politically in Adventism. And we're living presently in the long, long trajectory of the outworking of that principle. So an angel comes to Ellen White. I guess that was happening. It's amazing to think about. I wasn't born and raised in Adventist, so I'm still blown away by the fact that we, I was an Adventist for like a year before I knew we had a prophet. I was like, we had a prophet? Where is she? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a prophet. All these books that, you're, that we've been giving you as gifts. I mean, they were piling up, red books, black books, books without pictures, without number. <laughs> I was 18 years old, and they were like, yeah, she's a prophet. I was like, can I meet her? Where is she? Does she live in San Diego? No, she's dead. It was a long time ago. Oh, that's how foreign religion was to me, and Adventism was. But angels would come to her and tell her things. So she says in one letter to G.I. Butler, the general conference president, who she's up to here with in his rejection of the gospel and pushback, she says, an angel came to her and said that a time of trouble was before us as Adventists and great evils. Well, what kind of evils? What, you know, financial problems, uh, organizational problems. What kind of evil? The angel told her that a, that a time of trial was before us Adventists and great evils would be the result of the Phariseeism which has, in a large degree, taken possession of those who occupy important positions in the work of God. He said, the angel, she's saying, this angel told me that the work of Christ upon the earth was to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. And the angel told her, and the work of his people must correspond with the work of Christ. The angel is telling Ellen White that you'll know the real gospel when you hear it because it starts setting people free. It starts lifting the burden of legalism off their shoulders. The shame begins to dissipate and people begin to feel as though God loves them. And they begin to live in the energy of that love. So Ellen White went on to her grave saying things like this in rapid fire succession. The danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people, corporately, false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the Adventist mind on this point. Justification by faith. The law of God, she says, has been largely dwelt upon and has been presented to congregations almost as destitute of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his relation to the law as was the offering of Cain. She's saying Adventist preaching is as void of Christ as the offering of Cain. If you're going to have a prophet, you want a spunky chick who will tell it like it is. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to have one, right? And then she says this, the thought, the thought, just take this thought on board, the thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. The enemy of God, she goes on and says, the enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. I'm adding over Adventism. 
Adventism will be set free from satanic oppression when righteousness by faith becomes the pervasive theme on our lips. She says in another place, our churches are dying. Have you been wondering why they're dying? Our churches are dying for want of teaching on the subject of righteousness by faith in Christ and on kindred truths. That's why they're dying. And then she says this. this. This brought me, when I was a teenager, this brought me to my knees. I can see myself on my knees shedding tears when I read this. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all. This sounds important, doesn't it? What is it, Ellen? I mean, what is the thing that we need to just say over and over and over and over and over again? What is the thing that we need to emphasize? What is the thing that we need to preach with gusto and vim and vigor and clarity? What is the thing, Ellen? What is the thing? There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Christ alone. <laughs> this is like the chord on the guitar that we need to be strumming over and over again. And then she says this. I think this is the last one. You're hoping it's the last one. <laughs> she says, she's just, she's, there's, a, there's a tone of, she's like, she's like frustrated, I guess in a sanctified way, if you need your prophet to always be sanctified. I think she was upset. <laughs> she probably had to repent, but she said this. She said, let the law take care of itself. She was just like, oh, 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 oh. seriously, again? I mean, haven't we nailed that down? She's saying, let the law take care of itself. We have been at work, she means theologically, tracts, Bible studies, sermons. We have been at work on the law until we are as dry as the hills of Galboa without dew or rain. Let the law take care of itself. And we can't do it as a people. The moment you begin to preach the gospel in Adventism, people get nervous. People are like, ah, 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 where's this going? Somebody might sin. If God is made out to be too good, somebody might feel free, and we can't have that. I'm serious. You begin to preach the gospel in Adventism, and people will come up to you. Some of you will come up to you tonight, and you will say, but don't we need to be preaching the truth? Don't we need to be preaching the third angel's message? Well, yeah, this is it. This is it. All you've been hearing tonight is the third angel's message. So she goes on. This is amazing. She says, let the law take care of itself. We've been at work on the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa without due rain. I've never been there. I don't know how dry those hills are. They're really dry, apparently. <laughs> let us trust, she says, in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the theme that attracts the heart of the sinner is Christ and him crucified. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus stands revealed to the world in unparalleled love. Present him thus to the hungering multitudes, and the light of his love will win them from darkness to light, from transgression to obedience and true holiness. She's saying that the holiness part, the obedience part, the law part will take care of itself if we would just preach the gospel. So the sock in the Adventist britches. Have you guessed it? The sock in the Adventist britches is legalism. We've been carrying it around for a long time. We need to just get alone somewhere in private, every one of us, undo our belt, reach down in there, and pull that thing out. But I'm suggesting to you, <laughs> I'm suggesting to you, <laughs> I'm suggesting to you tonight that that our problem is worse. We don't just have a sock in our britches. We have two socks. We have the socks, the twin socks, a pair. We have a pair of socks. 
A pair of socks, I'm sorry. We have a pair, I don't want you to ever forget this message. That's why I'm using this illustration. Every time from now on you put on your socks, you're like, hmm, God is good. Jesus is wonderful. You'll never have an encounter with socks again that you do not think of the gospel. So the pair of socks in the Adventist situation is legalism and shame, you guys. And it, it's hurting us. It's hurting us. It's hurting our young people. It is messing with us. The primary cause of our aging, and I don't mean aging in a good sense, but demographically aging where young people are bolting left, right, and center, they're just out of here. I gave you the stats in our first time, first session together. The reason, the primary reason that Adventism as a denomination is aging demographically is because of this cycle of shame and effort and failure which feeds shame until you just give up in despair. And you just can't do it anymore because legalism is an aging influence. Legalism is draining. Legalism is depleting of spiritual energy. Legalism is damaging to relationships. Legalism is degenerating. It's degenerative. It will literally biologically mess with your immune system. Legalism is debilitating ultimately and it's killing us as a people. Legalism invariably gives birth to control which in turn kills trust in relationships and creativity which is where young people live. Young people live psychologically, emotionally in the realm <clears throat> of creativity and trust. And intuitively, if they can't sniff it out, if they can't sense the freedom that is in Christ, if they can't sense that there is trust and there is freedom to be creative in the advancement of God's cause, the fastest and surest way to drive out this generation is to impose shame and control. It's bad psychology. You cannot come up with a worse idea for killing Adventism than to continue hiding the glorious gospel of Christ from our children and our young people and continue hammering them with legalism, producing shame, and draining from them any desire to sweep the kitchen. They're just going to run. Young people run from legalism. That's my point tonight. But I'm telling you, here's the good news, because you want some. Young people run to love. And I'm suggesting to you this evening, in closing, that almost no human being, and especially young people, almost nobody will ever leave a social environment in which they feel known and loved. If, if a person feels seen and heard and taken into account and loved and accepted, they're not going anywhere. They're going to be a part of that situation. They want to be a part of that situation. So the cause of our denominational aging, I think, is legalism, and what we desperately need as a people is a revival not of behaviorism or moralism or we need a revival of pure gospel of grace in Adventism. And if it makes you nervous, just watch what it produces in people's lives as the fruit that follows. Thanks for your time tonight. By the way, that was an hour and 15 minutes if you were wondering. <laughs>